Okay, this is part eight of the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. This is a reading of Lars Fischer's book and study of the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the Imperial German state during the period of the Second International and what uh, confusion reigned uh, uh, amongst all of the great theoreticians of the Second International, Mehring, Kautsky, Bernstein. Exceptions, partial exception I would make out to be Rosa Luxemburg. And Engels is notable for the sanity and clarity of thought that he exhibits. Okay, I'll go into a, a share mode here and bring up the text for you, and I will not only share, but I will comment on what I am sharing. And this is Dr. Abraham Weisfeld speaking, PhD Political Science of the University of Quebec at Montréal, and a second generation refugee Holocaust survivor, who is speaking to you here and now. And here we progress to August Bebel and Zer Judenfrage. The locus classicus for any discussion of Bebel's stance on anti-Semitism and, quote-unquote, the Jewish question, is his much-cited speech at the 1893 Party Congress in Cologne. This speech has had a remarkable good press. Rolup has accredited it with a, quote, penetrating analysis of the causes, form, and functions of political anti-Semitism, unquote. To Lachshan Seipel's mind, it presents a, quote, detailed and still valid analysis of the function of anti-Semitism and its social following, unquote. Henke, too, would have us counted among, quote, the great sociologically substantiated analysis of anti-Semitism, unquote. That said, Luchens Seipel also claims that Schneidemann's infamous lament on the degeneration of the anti-Semitic movement, published in the Neozeit in 1906, a text we will discuss at the end of this chapter, offered, quote, no substantially new aspects that went beyond Babel's analysis of 1893, unquote. This already demonstrates that we may be well advised not to get unduly carried away by the anti judeophobic credentials of Babel's speech. It's, quote-unquote, still valid analysis notwithstanding. Uh, I just need a, a swig of water here. Swig. That's from um, 1956 American television programs. Okay. This general enthusiasm for Babel's speech is probably due at least in part simply to the fact that Babel's speech is undeniably, in almost every respect, considerably less offensive in its portrayal of Jewry than Zerjudenfrage and many other relevant pronouncements. The less offensive tone apart... The esteem in which Babel's speech is held by many also illustrates the vagaries of the kernel of truth approach to anti-Semitism, to which both Rurup and Lachshin Seipel certainly subscribe. After all, as Jack Jacobs has pointed out, Babel's speech, quote, does not deny the anti-Semitic charge of Jewish exploitation, quote-unquote, but merely condemns it as one-sided, nor, for that matter, does it offer any sort of moral condemnation of anti-Semitism. In other respects, too, the entitlement of Babel's speech to the anti judeophobic credentials that has often been granted deserves careful examination. Much emphasis has been placed on Babel's use of irony, especially in connection with his portrayal of anti-Semitism as an expression of envy felt by lazy or inept Germans vis-a-vis -vis determined and diligent Jews. His ostensible insistence 
on the fact that the admittedly irksome character traits of the Jews were a product of the conditions they had endured in the course of their history, rather than immutable characteristics, also features prominently in evaluations of his speech. Yet the consistency, consistency of this insistence is as questionable as the extent to which his use of irony really represents a redeeming feature. While Babel clearly did concede the importance of historical factors, he also persist persistently portrayed them as having reinforced intrinsic Jewish traits. Thus, to give an example, he explained how, quote, due to their historical development, the natural inclination and disposition of the Jews to trade has been furthered and developed in the extreme, unquote. Natural inclination and disposition. Not only inclination, but a disposition. Well, wow, that's pretty strong. Strong language there. Okay, for the quote, if a race, oh yeah, a race, sure, yeah. If a race is persecuted and isolated over a long succession of generations and circumstances, compel it to withdraw into itself. <laughs> wow, what a way to describe the national oppression. And circumstances, its circumstances compel it to withdraw into itself, then it already follows from Darwin's law of adaptation and hereditary transmission that the particular characteristics of the race in question will be developed and perfected more and more over time. The persecution adds its particular imprint to this development, and hence Jewry took on its present guise. Oh, so there is persecution, but it's only an additional factor, I see. So the actual problem is the Jewish people. Hmm. Okay, unquote. I am not suggesting that Babel's mild-mannered adherence to racial logic at this point is in any way unusual, let alone particularly emphatic or malign, given the intellectual and cultural context in which he and his peers were moving. Yeah, cultural context, intellectual, cultural context of depravement and ignorance and prejudice and liberalism and populism. Were it not for his explicit reference to Darwin, huh, <laughs> Darwin uses a cover for any unscientific arguments that are to be made. Okay, we're not for as explicit a reference to Darwin. One would almost be tempted to assume he might still have been using the term race in the old-fashioned way designed to deny, to denote nothing more than an ethnic group, uh, to which I would add that there's more than one ethnic group in the Jewish people, <laughs> you know, like, to say the least. What I would suggest, though, is this. Rather than simply ignoring it, one would surely need to critically engage the fact that Babel resorted to this kind of racialized conceptualization, yes, in order to determine whether or to what extent his speech might ne nevertheless qualify as a penetrating, still valid, greatly sociologically sustained, subs substantiated analysis of anti-Semitism, to which it is claimed to be. As for his use of irony, if the minutes of the Congress are anything to go by, it's certainly true that Babel repeatedly aroused the amusement of the delegates. He did so, for instance, with his reference to the quote-unquote additional malheur that burdened the Jew, namely that of, quote, of a conspicuous physical appearance so that one immediately recognizes the Jew by his nose brackets, amusement amongst the delegates of the Second International, this is, since he is therefore in the eyes of his foes already distinguished by nature. But not according to Fanon. Fanon says, no, 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 it's not true. Oh, yeah. Babel explained, quote, we find here an additional element that furthers hatred and enmity. An additional feature that furthers hatred and enmity? My nose? <laughs> My nose is responsible for all that? Okay. When touching on instances in which Jews 
had been forced to wear distinguishing garments or markers, he again added, quote, the characteristic nose was not enough. Amusement amongst the delegates again. He also aroused the delegates' amusement by stating that, quote, throughout all of human history, there are only two examples, two peoples that, despite living fragmented and dispersed among foreign peoples, have maintained themselves in, to in total purity. These are the Jews and the gypsies. Again, amusement amongst the delegates. Yeah, we got thrown in with the gypsies. <laughs> Romani revolution, yeah, man. Okay, I am at a loss to explain why the delegates should have found this amusing, but suspect that I'm better off not knowing why. Easier to explain is why Babel struck a chord with his comrades when claiming that in one respect, the Jews do distinguish themselves positively. Oh, one, they have adhered strictly to the commandment of their fathers. Be fruitful and multiply like sand at the beach. Considerable amusement amongst the delegates. Well, condemn them all. Now, the birth rate was lower among German Jews than among non-Jewish Germans throughout the 19th century. Indeed, German Jewry was, by this time, discernibly at the forefront of the bourgeois trend to limit family sizes, preceding similar developments among their non-Jewish compatriots by some two decades. How then does Babel's amusing remark about Jewish fertility fit into the context of a quote, great sociologically substantiated analysis. Wow. Down with academia. Yeah. Classical academia is is gone. You know, like, forget it. That's about all you get in undergraduates, you know, political science. Okay. Just how limited Babel's interest in and knowledge of contemporary Jewry actually was, il was it illustrated rather dramatically by a remark he made in the Reichstag Parliament, German Parliament, in the spring of 1904. On the 20th of February, 1904, Reichskanzler von Hulow, 1849 to 1920, made a reference in the Reichstag to Russian students in Berlin who were engaged in radical political activities. They would be deported if they did not desist. The radical student activity, Bulow, Bulow claimed, transpired, quote, under the leadership of Mandelstam and Silberfarbe. Sounds Jewish, yeah, unquote. It seems obvious enough that Bulo singled out these two because their names were recognizably Jewish, and thus had pejorative connotations, well suited to denounce the activities of the Russian students as a whole as subversive. We will have to cause to return to this denunciation of Mandelstam and Silberfarbe in the final chapter. Okay. Following their actual expulsion, Babel took the opportunity on the 14th of April, 1904, to remark on the matter in the Reichstag. The way in which the names Mandelstram and Zilberfag had been utilized in public debate was despicable, Babel declared. The two deserved for the truth for about their personalities and activities to be made public. Before turning to Mandelstram and relating his biography at some length, Babel sought to demonstrate how utterly misguided Bulow had been in mentioning Silberfarg in this context. Silberfarg was, quote, neither an anarchist nor a terrorist, is not even a socialist, Babel explained. Rather, this Silberfarg is a Zionist. Hear, hear from the Social Democrats. <laughs> how bad can this get? In other words, Babel went on to explain. He is an Orthodox Jew and nothing could be further from the mind of a man of this inclination than revolutionary machinations, unquote. Now, how much of an expert in Jewish affairs did one have to be by 1904 to realize, to single out just this one issue, that Orthodox Jew and Zionist were hardly terms that one could simply be used synonymously, synonymously or interchangeably? In his speech in Cologne, Babel also dabbed in the application of a range of the usual highly ambivalent anti-Semitic arguments, having described 
the long history of discriminatory measures and legislation. For instance, he concluded, oh, here's your footnotes. Now, he says, if all this legislation that, as mentioned, has continued in various varying forms for almost one and a half millennia did not achieve its goal, then this alone should be proof enough for the enemies of the Jews that their endeavors are impractical and would not become practicable even in the unthinkable case that they gain power. Unquote. This is a statement made half a century before the Shoah, and in some respects, it is a good illustration of just how different the world has become after Auschwitz. Clearly, it was practicable for the anti-Semites, who finally did gain power, to first comprehensively exclude the Jews from society, and then proceed to an even more radical solution by physically annihilating them, us, me. It would be unjust to suggest that Babel and his peers could have foreseen this development. Even so, the suggestion that one could undermine the anti-Semites' case by criticizing them for their inability to carry out their threats or keep their promises, depending on one's perspective, clearly has a particularly hunting quality and seems to be tempting fate in a most unfortunate way. On the other hand, we would have more than enough cause to be profoundly concerned about anti-Semitism, even if the Shoah had never been perpetuated. But the imperial German social democrats were entirely oblivious to the threat, even on this level, and for this failure, they can most certainly be held accountable. Okay, let's take a break here. Okay, this is uh, enough for today. You know, when you see how mistaken these supposedly principled, most advanced civilized minds of the world could be, then it brings you to question everything, including the question, I suppose. But we continue.